How's everyone doing? Good. I tell you what, that was a uh, a good song there. I didn't know after what uh, they had to say and after the singing if we even need to have any preaching, right? Because it's all about Jesus, right? Is it about anything else? It shouldn't be, right? But then life happens and bills come due and families get into arguments and storms happen. Quickly we can forget about what it's all about, right? There's one person here that agrees with that, right? Everybody else must be the those perfect people we hear about. I don't know about you all, but I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God. Don't look at me, look at my Savior. Because if you look at me, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Because I'm a sinner. I make mistakes. I'm a liar. I'm a thief. And you can put anything else in there. And you know what? Anybody in here who doesn't think that you're one of those, you're a hypocrite, right? Amen. Appreciate uh, Pastor Bruce asking me to come fill in him for him today. I'm glad it worked out. I was supposed to be in Myrtle Beach yesterday speaking at a men's conference. But uh, something about that hurricane that came through. And if you... If you're not, I mean, there's some people in the U.S. who are hurting, but if you haven't taken a moment to pray for those who are in the Bahamas, in the Caribbean, you know, you think you have problems till you see those images. 70,000 people who are homeless. Dozens right now that are dead, but it'll be in the hundreds, maybe the thousands by the time they finish the count. You just think about that. And there's a, in the Bahamas, there's a 70-ish percent are evangelical Christians. It's a very strong religious area. And sometimes we can get in our own little bubbles, right? Get in our own little spheres, and we don't realize how others are hurting. Appreciate uh, everything that you all here as a, a church are doing. I um, appreciate the music. And have we got the screens up? Are they... Am I connected up? You might, will this top one turn on here for me? Remote on the side. All right. Is this the power one? That's all right. If it doesn't work, I'll get my 14-year-old daughter up here because, as you know, kids know technology better than us old folks, right? It's good to have my wife, Jordan, with me today. We've been married for almost 16 years. When I got married, my daddy told me I could be one of two things. He's been married for almost 53 now. He said I could be right or I could be happy. Do you know that not one single woman in here laughed? took me 10 years to figure out that I just needed to be happy. It's good to have my daughter with me too, uh, Abigail. Abigail was 14 and just started high school. So um, that's... uh, Interesting time for any fathers out there who know that with their uh, daughters and that. So what I want to talk with you about today is called In Order. And it's amazing how the Holy Spirit works. Friday, I was going to talk on something totally different. Because that's just kind of what I was going to like. I'll go to my normal fallback. You know, preacher asked me to come preach at a church. Well, I'll give this message. And Sunday, uh, Saturday morning, I was like, you know, I just feel like that's not what I need to talk about. In every song that y'all sang today, he lives, this is my father's world, wonderful grace of Jesus, the family of God, and it being all about Jesus was what I ended up preparing on yesterday. And the topic I want to talk with you today is 1 Corinthians 1440. If you'll turn there with me, or we'll read God's word, it says, let all things be done decently and in order. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the time that you've given us today, Lord. Thank you for the freedom to come together and worship you and praise your name, Lord. We pray for those who are hurting, those who are suffering, those who have things in their lives, God, that they don't feel like they can handle. Let them look to you, Lord. We pray for those in the Bahamas. We pray for those all around the world who are suffering of of tragedies and 
situations beyond their control, Lord. Give them peace and comfort in their lives. Lord, if there's anyone in this building today who hasn't accepted you as their personal Savior, Lord, let the Holy Spirit work in their life. Let them realize that there's no reason to be embarrassed or ashamed or concerned about what anybody else thinks. Lord, let them come to know you. Let them accept Jesus as their Savior. In your heavenly name, amen. So 1 Corinthians 14.40 says, Let all things be done decently and in order. When you look at this in context here, what's going on? Well, Paul's writing to the church of Corinth. They are doing some things they shouldn't be doing. They're abusing. They're abusing. They're prideful. They're conceited. So he's rebuking them. He's writing to them and he's saying, you're misusing your gifts. I'm a good Christian. My life's perfect. You heard that one before? If you ever meet a Christian who has a perfect, perfect life, you need to really ask them where they are with God. He's telling them they're confusing others. There's nowhere in the Bible that says, if you're a Christian, your life is going to be a bed of roses. There's nowhere in the Bible that says, if you're a Christian, your life's going to be easier than the person who's not a Christian. Actually, scriptures are very clear that if we are Christians, life is normally going to be harder. Because doing the right thing is harder than doing the wrong thing, right? He's telling them they aren't doing things in order. And we're not going to spend too much time in Corinthians here because, as I said about these songs and what y'all sang today, how this really bleeds into what I wanted to talk about today. So what's the meaning of order? When Paul says here to the Corinthians, you're not doing this in order, what does that mean? What it means, the Greek word here is taxis, T-A-X-I-S. Sounds like a good government word, right? It means arrangement. It means a ranking, a military. It means you start here and you do this and you do this and you do this and you do this. There's somebody in charge. There's somebody below them. Then it goes on down. It's set in place. It's unchangeable. This is how things can be done if you want to. No. Well, if you feel like doing it today, nope. It's a preset, God-ordained order of how things are to be done. And sometimes in our lives that can be challenging, right? What is Paul telling the Corinthians? You have pride? Pride's a very powerful thing, right? Pride's one of those things that destroys marriages. Destroys churches, destroys kids, destroys governments. It's something that has to be dealt with. Everything has order. There's nothing in our life that does not have order. Marriage, I mean creation and marriage, life. Got out of order there, sorry about that. So you got creation has order, life has order, marriage has order, sports has order. There's a way things have to be done. There's a way scoring's kept. There's rules. Even the church has order. Who's the head of the church? Jesus Christ. You look at Ephesians 5.23. It says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. If it's not about Jesus, what's church about? Getting together, gossiping, fellowshipping, closing the doors and not saying, hey, well, that person doesn't look like me, so therefore I don't want them in my church. What makes up the church? What's the part of the church? Is it the building? Is this building we stand in here, is this the church? Unfortunately, in a lot of places, this has become the church, right? It's the building. How big is the building? How big is the stained glass windows? How many people do we have, you know, coming? What 
those are the things that have, in, unfortunately, in some areas become the church. But a building is not the church. The church is a body of believers. Amen. People who have put their mind and their heart and their soul and their eternity in their relationship with Jesus Christ. They've recognized that without Jesus Christ, they are dying and going to hell. It's an assembly. So we've got Christ at the top of the, the church. He's the head of the church. We've got the believers who are the body, who are the church, who make up the church. So let me ask you this. Do you only have to be a believer when you're in church? We call them Sunday morning Christians, right? And I've been guilty of it, and everybody in here has been guilty of it. We come to church, we're holier than thou, we sing all the songs, we praise God, and we leave and we become just like the world. So what are believers called to be? We've gone from Christ being the head of the church, the saved, the evangelical Christian is the, is the believers, they're the body. We're called to be Christ-like. Isn't, isn't that what the scriptures say? We're to conform to the image of Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 29 says, conform to the image of his son. I hope you see where I'm going with this because I'm getting ready to maybe step on some toes. And that's the great thing about being a guest preacher. If I step on anybody's toes, I get to leave and go home. What happens when believers are Christ-like? They love God with all their heart. Mark 12, 30 says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. If you're an evangelical Christian, if you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and you're not Christ-like, you've got to really look at your relationship with Jesus. You've got to really dig in. Do you really have a personal relationship with him? Are you really loving God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind? They show the love of Christ to others. If you're Christ-like, you show the love of Christ to others. Even if you don't agree with them. Even if you don't like them. Even if you don't like their politics. Even if you don't like their sexual lifestyle. You don't have to go out and hang out with them. You don't have to go party with them. You don't have to agree with their lifestyle or support it. But Mark 12, 31 says, And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. How can you show the love of Christ to someone? How can you share the gospel with them if you don't like them? How can you share the gospel with someone if you're being rude to them? When Jesus walked up to the woman at the well, what did he say to her? Hey, you woman of the night and a bunch of other names that I won't put in? Did he walk up and point out what she was and immediately jump into saying how horrible of a person she was and how dare she do that with her life and her body and how she needed to get her heart right with God? No. Did he eventually say those things in a loving and caring way? Yes. What else happens when believers are Christ-like? They share the gospel with others. When's the last time you shared what God had done for you? When's the last time you told someone what Jesus Christ did for you in your life? When's the last time you told someone what God did for you? 
You don't have to go up and talk to someone and say, hey, if you're not saved, you're, not, you're going to hell. You don't have to say it that way. You can walk up to someone and say, you know what? On my way to church this morning, somebody almost pulled out and hit me. And God protected me. My kid was having a problem at school. And this really nice teacher stepped in and helped me resolve the issue. And I praise God for bringing that person along. But too often, what are we doing with our lives? Oh, my life is so bad. Oh, my life is so horrible. I tell people, if you want to see a bunch of miserable people, look like they've been sucking on lemons, walk into most churches on a Sunday morning. I said, you'll meet some of the most downtrodden, miserable, stressed out, anxious, just grumpy old-faced people you'll ever meet in your entire life. Life are normally Christians. Do you know when the number one time that waitresses and waiters don't want to work? The shift that they ask not to be assigned to. Sunday after church. Do you know why? Because Christians are rude to them, mean to them, and leave little or no tip. What does Romans say? Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess and you'll give an account for only the actions that you think you had the right to do? Or you'll give an account for every action? Nobody's left yet, so that's a good sign. Mark 16, 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world. He didn't say just go into your little corner where you agree with everybody. He didn't say just go within the church. He said go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Can you imagine what our country and our world would be like if Christians would get on fire for God? Can you imagine if we could get 10% of the church to get on fire for God. To go soul winning and show the love of Christ and share the gospel and share what God has done for you. Can you imagine? Instead, we use social media to complain about how bad our day is. We use social media to complain about how another Christian has done us wrong. And I'm guilty of all this. I'm, I'm not standing up here saying, hey, I'm perfect and I've got all this figured out. The reason I got into this part of, of ministry is based on my own life story. I have a ministry called Handling Life. It's materials based from a Bible-based, Christ-centered perspective based on my story of how I became a modern-day Jonah. Wouldn't do anything wrong. Jonah didn't do anything wrong. From an earthly standpoint, he bought a ticket, got on a boat, went for a ride. And if you're a Christian and you're, you've been there or you're currently there, you know what happens. The storm keeps getting stronger and stronger and stronger. It's not because you're not doing anything from an earthly standpoint bad. It's because you're not doing what God wants you to do. Amen. And these are the things that God wants us to do. So if you've got storms in your lives and you're not Job, it's not life, it's not things that you don't have control over, it's things you do have control over. You're not loving God with all your heart. Does anybody control that? Is there anybody in this room or in your life that controls how much you can love God? No. Is there anybody here that controls how much you can show the love of Christ to others? Or who you can share the gospel with? You know what else happens when you're Christ-like? You listen to others. James 1.19 says, Wherefore, my bro beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. 
Wouldn't it be amazing if the church body would start listening to each other and stop gossiping? Hey, did you hear about Brother Nathan? I got to share this prayer request with you. That tears the church apart. They tame their tongue. There's a bunch of verses on this, but I like the Proverbs 15.1. A soft answer turneth away wrath. Have you ever had that three-hour argument with your wife over a cabinet door slamming? Amen, brother. Right? A soft answer turneth away wrath. Is it ever about the cabinet door? No. It's about something else. It's about a stressful day at work. It's about a family member being sick. It's a financial burden. Something else. But the lines of communication are so broken. The, the ability to sit down and talk about the issues is not there. Why? Because we're not loving God with all our heart. We're not showing the love of Christ to others. It's kind of hard to get mad at somebody if you're showing them the love of Christ. Right? They forgive others. This is a tough one. Ephesians 4, 31 through 32 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sakes hath forgiven you. Amen. You know, one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life is forgive someone who hasn't asked for it. And if you, everybody in here, if you think about it, there's someone or many people in your life who have done you wrong. They've stolen money from you, cheated on you, something. And it can plant that seed of bitterness that will eat you alive. Amen. For 10 years of my life, I spent my business time trying to prove someone wrong because of something they had done to me. You know that 10 years, they probably never thought about that very much. Probably didn't affect them very much at all. You know what it did to me? It made me into where people gave me the compliment that I would make a good attorney. Any attorneys in here? That's not a compliment. When business associates and business partners look at you and say, you'd make a good attorney, they're not being nice. If you let that bitterness build up in you, it will affect you. It will affect your relationship with others. It will affect people that you don't even know. Did Jonah affect people he didn't know? He affected the people in Nineveh. How many people didn't hear the gospel because Jonah wasn't where he was supposed to be? Here's one you're going to like. They asked to be forgiven. Confess your faults one to another, James 5, 16 says. Here is one of the hardest things I've ever done. Have you ever gone to someone and apologized and said, you know, I'm sorry, but if you hadn't have done that, I wouldn't have done what I did? Works really well with my wife. Have you gotten those apologies before? Are they an apology? No. James says, confess your faults to one another. If there's anybody in this church and you've got something against somebody else in this church, I hope by the end of this day, by the end of this service is over, you'll go make it right with them. Yeah. Accept your personal responsibility. Accept what you did in the situation. Because who's going to stand before God? Who's going to give an account for their actions? You know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to give an account for my wife's actions. 
I'm not going to give an account for my parents' actions or my brother's actions, or I'm not going to give an account for anybody's actions. I'm only going to give an account for my actions. So if you need to apologize to somebody, and you've been making excuses in your mind why you shouldn't, who's giving you those excuses? The devil. Do you know why? Because he doesn't want you to where God wants you to be. Because if you've got bitterness in your heart, and if you've done somebody wrong, you can't be where God wants you to be. Because you're not doing what it takes to be Christ-like. This is the order. This is what God has told us to do in our lives. This is a non-negotiable. He didn't say, confess your faults to one another if you feel like it. Or you feel like you were right and you shouldn't, don't do it. There's no buts after this, right? There's no outs here. So in your mind, if you're creating an out of why you shouldn't ask someone for forgiveness, you're in direct conflict with being Christ-like. Christ-like people control their pride. What does Proverbs say? Pride goeth before destruction. Pride goeth before a fall. Anybody in here want to admit that pride has caused them horrible issues in their life? Eve, Adam, pride. See, because pride makes us think we know better than God. Pride makes us think that we have a better solution to our problems than God. What is it all about? Jesus. They pray to God. What's your prayer life like? Besides praying for your meals. Are you are you openly communicating with God on a regular basis? All day long, pray without ceasing. See, I grew up in a household that had got into the, the philosophy that you need to get down on your hands and your knees. Get down on your knees and fold your hands for 30 minutes every morning. And that was your prayer life. Kind of like turning the light switch on, forget about it, and go on throughout the rest of your day. That's not prayer. That's a tradition. That's a ceremony. Prayer is communicating with God all throughout the day. How can you control your tongue? How can you have a soft answer when someone comes at you? Through your relationship with God. It's the only way. By communicating with Him and saying, God, please give me the the grace or the mercy or the wisdom or the compassion or whatever right now during this moment, during this. You can have your eyes open. Somebody can be standing in front of you yelling at you. And you can be sitting there talking to God in your head. Might have to put some of the other voices to the side, right? To, you know. (laughs) You can, right? If you want a relationship with someone, do you communicate with them? Yeah. If you're married and you didn't talk to your spouse for six months, what kind of relationship would that be? If you did talk to them and all you ever said to them was like, hey, Thanks. Hope you're doing well. Love you. If that was the only communication you had with your spouse, how long would you be married? Well, I'm asking this, how long would you have a happy marriage? Not be married for a long time. <laughs> Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You've got to develop that prayer life. And it can't be just, hey God, I need this. Hey God, I want that. Hey God, take care of this. Hey God, I got myself in trouble. Can you get me out of this? Hey God, I need this. Hey God, I need that. For a long time I tried to treat God like an ATM. I'd run to the ATM and try to withdraw money. Then I'd get mad when there was no money in the ATM. But I hadn't put any time. I hadn't hadn't had the job. I hadn't put any money in the bank. I was asking for the wrong things. 
I was asking for things that I shouldn't even been involved with. Situations I shouldn't even have been in. Jonah shouldn't have been on that boat. If he wouldn't have been on that boat, he wouldn't have been in the storm. And if he wouldn't have been in the storm, he wouldn't have been in the belly of the fish. So stop blaming God for the situation that you put yourself in. Was the well punishment or deliverance? Deliverance. If the well wouldn't have been there, Jonah would have what? Drowned. Would Jonah have preferred God would have delivered him in a, a different way? Maybe a flying carpet or nice Boeing 747? Or no, which, which Boeing's grounded right now? He would have preferred something else, right? But when you put yourself in a situation that you shouldn't be in because you denied doing what God has asked you to do, can you get mad at God? Can you question where God is? Oh, yeah, we're, that's what we do. Where's God in my life? Why, why is God doing this to me? Maybe God's not doing it to you. Maybe you did it to yourself. I did it to myself. Had to deal with our pride to be able to admit that. When we're Christ-like, we're an example. This is our church verse for this year at Kerwin. It says, let no man despise thy youth, but, and our quote here is, be thou an example. When people look at you at work, the gym, driving down the road, if you have a sticker for this church on the back of your road and you have road rage, take the sticker off. One of my wife's friends uh, texted her a while back, and she's like, hey, I used to have church bumper on my, my car and I just decided to go ahead and just take it off because I have so much road rage. At least she owned it, right? Be an example. For a long time in my life, and I'm, a, I'm ashamed to admit this, but this is what the Lord has laid on my life to share with others, is to be real. What my walk was like, because I know other people have the same walk. For a long time in my life, I was one of those that if someone looked at, they looked at me and said, if Nathan Tabor is a Christian, and that's what a Christian is like? No, thank you. Got a temper. Drood. He's short. Yells a lot. He really yell. We get loud, get loud a lot. He doesn't compromise. He's unfair. Is that what people see when they look at you? Do they see Christ or do they see the flesh? Do they see the love? Do they see compassion and caring? Or do they see the flesh? This is one of those orders. This is one of those non-negotiables. It doesn't say be an example if you feel like it. Be an example if you're having a good day. It's okay if you're having a bad day. You don't have to be an example. If you just lost your job, you're excluded from this. Does it say that? Does it say there's any reason here that you're not supposed to be an example? No. So you're supposed to be an example at all times. And if you're Christ-like, you have fruits of the Spirit, and this kind of covers a lot of them. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Do you have these things in your life? Do you know there's a difference between being happy and being joyful? We hear a lot today in our society, oh, I want to be happy. No, you don't. Because happiness comes and goes. You can be happy when you leave this building and somebody rear ends you. What happens to happy? It's gone. It's good Southern English there. I grew up in northern Alabama, so I've not used ain't yet today. We'll get to that one in a little bit. Happy comes and goes. You got money one day, you're happy. Pay the bills the next, happy going. Right? What's joy? Joy in all circumstances. Not joy in the circumstance. Joy in the circumstance because why? Because it's all about Jesus. The pain and suffering that you're going through today or the health issue or the financial issue or whatever you're going through Someday, 
it will be resolved. Someday you won't have that trial and tribulation. It might be today, it might be tomorrow, it might be a week, it might be a month, it might be a year. You may never have that resolved on this earth. But you can take joy in knowing when you step on those streets of gold that there will be no more pain and suffering. There will be no more trials and tribulations. How can you have that joy if you're not being Christ-like? So how does a believer do this? How do you get to this point? How do you sustain it? How do you stay there? It's a daily choice. It's choices every second, every minute, every hour of the day. What did Jesus say in Luke 9, 23? Take up your cross once and follow me. Get saved and everything will be all right and follow me. He said, take up your cross daily. Every day. It's a choice. We as Christians have a choice. We either let the flesh rule us or we let God rule us. We let Jesus Christ rule us. We let the Holy Spirit rule us. It's a choice. It's my choice. Now, I can step back and say, you know what? I can't do this because of what he does in my life or what she does in my life or the circumstances of my life. Does God give me any room in that? Is there any excuse for that? Is there any reason for that? No. Here's another way a believer does that. They study God's Word. How much time do you spend in this a day? How much time are you studying this? Because there's a direct correlation between how your day goes and your relationship with God. Now, I didn't talk, I'm not saying like how your day goes in the sense of how, what other things go and what you do in your job and your finances and all of that. I'm talking about your internal joy. Your internal love that you can show to others. How you share the gospel. I was watching on the news last night a, a lady from the Bahamas who had lost everything just wiped out. And she's sitting there talking about how God had protected her and her family and how much she was thanking Jesus for protecting her. I'm thinking, you know, here's somebody who's lost everything. I mean, it's just, it just wiped out. There's not even anything to rebuild. It's just got to be all piled up, thrown away, and then rebuilt. And she's sitting there on national TV thanking God in Jesus for what he has done in, their, in her life. Are you doing that? The only way you can do it is to study God's word. And 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. You know, most mornings, I don't have time to do this. I got something else to do. I got an email. I got a text. I got something, something going. So I'll do it in a little bit. A little bit comes, oh, I'll do it a little bit later. A little bit later comes, oh, I'll do it before I go to bed. I'm too tired. I'll do it tomorrow. And tomorrow comes and, oh, i got something to do. It's a choice. Take up your cross daily. So if you're struggling to get into God's word, you know whose fault that is? Yours. It's nobody else's. It's not your time. It's not your job. It's not your wife or your husband or your kids. There's no excuse. None. Romans says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess and will give an account for every action. You're going to sit up in front of God and say, hey God, you know what? I didn't have time to study your Bible because I was playing Candy Crush. Or I was on Facebook. Or God, the tennis you know, championship was on or the baseball champ, you know, something. What do you think God's going to take? Is he going to take that excuse? No. And then the third here is they apply God's to their work, to the, apply God's word to their life. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is knowing what to do. 
Wisdom is applying said knowledge. Anybody played in the street lately? You know, played in the road, interstate? You know not to, right? But then you take that and apply it to your life. Everything that you, we just went through, and this is just, I mean, the, the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. There is so much more that you can dig into and say, here's this, and here's this, and here's this, and here's this. Knowledge versus application. If you know God's word, but you're not applying it to your life, it's no good. That's when somebody looks at you and says, you're a hypocrite. That's when people looked at me and said, you're a hypocrite. You know what? They're right. If you say you love others, you got to love others. You don't have to agree with them. You just got to love them. James three seventeen. But the wisdom that is from above is first, first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. If you read James here, and I encourage you to do it, what's the opposite of biblical wisdom? Earthly wisdom, our own. Do you know what James says if you apply earthly wisdom to your life, what you get? Stress, anxiety, misery, conflict, unsettlement in your life. Are you at that point in your life right now? Are you at a point where you feel like you're either in order? Are you doing things the way God wants you to do them? <clears throat> do you feel like you have a good relationship with Jesus? Do you, have, you feel like you have a good relationship with God? Or do you feel a little bit out of order? That things just aren't going the way you want them to. See, if they're in order, God's my rock. If my life's where I need it to be, I'm like Psalms 18.2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. When I'm where God wants me to be and a challenge comes into my life, I immediately say, thank you, God, for protecting me and for delivering me and for being my rock and for being my God. I can't handle this, but you can. And when you're there, it's like, being on the rock, right? Secure. Unmovable. And people look at you and say, wow, I can't believe you handled that so well. Not me. I didn't handle it well. But through my relationship with God, He gave me what I needed to handle it. And if you're there, stay there. If you're there, do everything you can to not get off that rock. Can you? Sure, absolutely. Sin is sin. The flesh is the flesh. You can be right where God wants you one moment. Jonah, prophet, missionary, spreader of God's word, had the favor of the Lord, and he decided not to do what God had called him to do. And what happened to him? He got out of order. Why was he, not in, why was he out of order? Why was I out of order? Why are you out of order? Because you're not a doer. James 1.22 says, But be ye doers of the word. Apply God's word. Don't just be hearers. Knowledge. Knowledge and application. Another reason you're out of order. You're double-minded. What does James 1.8 says? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded woman is unstable in all her ways. This is not just this is not gender for just men. This is all mankind. You can't ride the fence with the Lord. And if you've ever grown up on a farm and gotten on a wooden fence and slid down it, what happens? You get splinters. Do you have splinters right now in your life? Are you causing stress? Are you causing anxiety? Are you causing misery? Are you causing conflict? Are your actions bringing storms into your life because you're double-minded? You want it both ways? You want God over here, you want a fence in the middle, and you want your life over here, and you only need God when you need Him? It doesn't work. It might for a time period. 
You know, when Jonah went out, he went and set sail, it was probably pretty for a while, right? I know when I've made choices to do my own thing, it didn't immediately, the sin, the consequences of my sin was not immediate. Sometimes it is. Most of the time it comes out later. So it's time to get into order. It's time to start doing the things the way God wants you to do them. It's time to start being Christ-like. And to do that, the first step is you've got to confess your sins. Not to me. Not to your pastor. Not to anybody in this auditorium. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're not Christ-like, and you think that nobody else knows? Do you want me to tell you the sad news? Everybody already knows. Because they can see it in your eyes. They can hear it in your voice. See it in your actions. Demeanor. Character. But you know who sees it the most? Who knows it all? Is God. When I was at this point in my life where I knew I needed to kind of, you know, well, maybe, yeah. Maybe I need to get right with God. You know what was one of the biggest arguments that went on in my mind? I can't tell God about that. What's he going to think? If I tell God that I'm not where he wants me to be, what is he going to do? What is he going to think about me? If you look into the 1 Corinthians 14 where we were, it says God's not the author of confusion. So if you're in your mind, you've got some argument in there why you shouldn't confess your sins, is that from God or the devil? It's from the devil. Because the devil wants to keep us off track with God. He wants to, to keep us from not sharing the gospel and sharing the love and doing all these other things. And the way he does that is by convincing us that through our pride, we don't need to forgive. We don't need to show love. We don't need to, we don't need to, we don't need because we're right and they're wrong. Forget about them. Start worrying about what God thinks about you. Start worrying about where you are in your relationship with God. And last year's come to God. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Is the stress and the anxiety and the misery and the conflict just wearing you down? Has it already worn you down? Do you not see the hope that's in Jesus Christ? You know it, and you can talk about it, but you've just lost sight of it. Matthew says in here that God says, come to me. I'll give you rest. The moment that I confessed my sins and, and, and made the move to make things right in my life, it was like the burdens just fell off. When Jonah got right with God, he was in the worst situation he'd ever been in in his entire life. Belly of a well, dark, seaweed around his head. He didn't know he was getting out in three days. He had no idea. He thought, rightfully so, he was going to die in the belly of that fish. What did he start doing? Praising the Lord. He was content. He was joyful. See, what Satan doesn't want us to know, and what he wants to keep us from, is we think it's better to be in the position we're in, even though we don't like it, because we think that's more comfortable than being where God wants us to be. Even if we're not physically as comfortable as we were, so we, we move over here. We go to where God wants us to be. Physically, we're not as comfortable as we were, but our lives are more content and more joy and more peace and yeah. everything in that. And we convince ourselves, oh, I need to stay over here where I want to be, even though I'm miserable. Not very smart, is it? So as we start to wrap up today, and uh, Brother, if you can go ahead and we can... Uh, do our uh, 
uh, closing here. Let me encourage you with this. One of the biggest struggles I had in my life was giving God control. I didn't want to give God control because I didn't want to give up control. Do you know what I have found in my life now? I'm 46 years old. I wish I'd have found this out when I was 20. The more control I give God, do you know what happens? The more control I get. It makes no sense from an earthly or, or from your mind standpoint. It makes none. But see, the more we give God control, the more we become Christ-like, the more we start doing things the way He wants us to do them, the more He's able to work in our lives. The more He's able to bring that joy and that contentment and that peace and that balance in our lives. But it doesn't make sense until you do it. And I can't convince you to do it. Only God can convince you to do it. So if you bow your heads with me. First, let me ask, is there anyone in here who's not saved? Because the most ultimate out of order is to not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible says the time is now. The Lord Jesus Christ can come back before I finish. You could die before I finish. I'm not about scaring people. I'm not going to do that. But I want you to know that there's nobody in here in this auditorium that if you know them or you don't know them or whatever, let me tell you this. They would rather you get saved today than to sit there and think that, oh my gosh, what are other people going to think about me? Amen. They would rather you come to know the Lord. So if you don't know Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to go on, get up out of your seat. Come down here to the front. And there's somebody in this church, a man or a woman, who will lead you to the Lord. Second, to those who have not accepted, to those who have accepted Jesus Christ, really the ones I was talking to today, where are you with God? What are you doing with Him? Are you being an example? If someone in your life could say to you and you not get upset, you're this type of person, what would you think about that? Are you stressed out? Are you anxious, miserable? Conflict, life laid you, you know, laying you out. You just don't see the hope anymore. Listen, don't stay in that corner. Yeah. Don't stay over there where God can't use you and where you're actually not being a good example. Don't let Satan convince you that God doesn't know or God doesn't care or you can't come back to God because you've done so much or you've been away so long. Or See, here's the convincing part. We always look at this and we look at it as prodigal son type people who have gone out into the world and done horrible things. How are they going to come back to God? Let me tell you this. God is as much concerned about you when you're a Jonah as you're a prodigal son. And if you're not doing anything bad in your life from an earthly standpoint, but you're not doing things in a Christ-like manner, it's time today to get that resolved. Yeah. It's time to surrender all to God. So stand, stand with me as we sing, uh, or as, as our pianist here plays, uh, I Surrender All.